The Lord be with you. And also with you. So we say together, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. What God has prepared for those who love him, he has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything. Let us, therefore, in penitence, open up our hearts to the Lord, who has prepared good things for those who love him. Let us confess that we have failed to heed the call of Christ upon our lives. And we say together, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. God, our Saviour, look on this wounded world in pity and in power, Hold us fast to your promises of peace, won for us by your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Father, by the obedience of your Son, Jesus, you brought salvation to our wayward world. Draw us into harmony with your will, that we may find all things restored in him, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so, a first reading, Lamentations, would someone like to come and lament for us? <coughs> first reading is from Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 22 to 33. The Lord loves us very much, so we haven't been completely destroyed. His loving concern never fails. His great love is new every morning. Lord, how faithful you are. I say to myself, the Lord is everything I, I will ever need, so I will put my hope in him. The Lord is good to those who put their hope in him. He is good to those who look to him. It is good when people wait quietly for the Lord to save them. It is good for a man to carry a heavy load of suffering while he is young. Let him sit alone and not say anything. The Lord has placed the load on him. Let him bury his face in the dust. There might still be hope for him. Let him turn his cheek towards those who would slap him. Let him, fill with, let him be filled with shame. The Lord does not turn his back on people forever. He might bring suffering, but he will also show loving concern. How great his faithful love is. He doesn't want to bring pain or suffering to anyone. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thank be you. to God. And our second reading, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. <coughs> The 
chapter 2 in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verses 7 to 15. You do well in everything else. You do well in faith and in speaking. You do well in knowledge and in com complete commitment. And you do well in the love we have helped to start you in. So make sure that you also do well in the grace of giving to others. I am not commanding you to do it, but I want to test you. I want to find out if you really love God. I want to compare your love with that of others. You know the grace shown by our Lord Jesus Christ. Even though he was rich, he became poor to help you. Because he became poor, you became rich. Here is my opinion about his, what is best for you in that matter. Last year, you were the first to give. You were also the first to want to give. So finish the work. Then your desire to do it will be matched by your, you, your finishing it. Give on the basis of what you have. Do you really want to give? Then the gift is measured by what someone has. It is not measured by what they don't have. We don't want others to have it easy at your expense. We want things to be equal. Right now you have plenty in order to take care of what they need. Then they will have plenty to take care of what you need. The goal is to even things out. It is written, the one who gathered a lot didn't have too much, and the one who gathered a little had enough. This is the word of the Lord. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus, no, that's not right. Yes, it is. Jesus went across the Sea of Galilee in a boat. It landed at the other side. There a large crowd gathered around him. Then a man named Jairus came. He was a synagogue leader. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He begged Jesus, please come. My little daughter is dying. Place your hands on her to heal her. Then she will live. So Jesus went with him. A large group of people followed. They crowded round him. A woman was there who had a sickness that made her bleed. It had lasted for 12 years. She'd suffered a great deal, even though she'd gone to many doctors. She'd spent all the money she had, but she was getting worse, not better. Then she heard about Jesus. She came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes. She thought, I just need to touch his clothes and I will be healed. Right away, her bleeding stopped. She felt in her body that her suffering was over. At once Jesus knew that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people, his disciples answered. They're crowding against you and you still ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around. He wanted to see who had touched him. Then the woman came and fell at his feet. She knew what had happened to her. She was shaking with fear. But she told him the whole truth. He said to her, Dear woman, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. You are free from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus. He was the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher any more? Jesus heard what they were saying. He told the synagogue leader, Don't be afraid. Just believe. He only let Peter, James and John, the brother of James, follow him. They came to the home of the synagogue leader. There Jesus saw a lot of confusion. People were crying and sobbing loudly. 
He went inside, and then he said to them, Why all this confusion and sobbing? The child is not dead, she's only sleeping. But they laughed at him. He made them all go outside. He took only the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him, and he went in where the child was. He took her by the hand, then he said to her, Talitha kum. This means, little girl, I say to you, get up. The girl was twelve years old. Right away she stood up and began to walk around. They were totally amazed at this. Jesus gave strict orders not to let anyone know what had happened, and he told them to give her something to eat. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. O Christ. I'm just going to stop for a second because Adobe Flash Player has decided it wants to interrupt me. Hopefully it hasn't interrupted everybody else. Well, three interesting readings this morning and I am pleased to be back and I can't wait to get into the round of home communions and everything that my week normally consists of. It's going to be so nice to see so many people. But you see, I can say that because I don't live in a time like our first reading, Lamentations, early 6th century BC, Babylon is acting, Jerusalem's going to fall, and those poems, those acrostics, those prayers that the book of Lamentation contains are all weepings and wailings. They are laments because everything is going to go pear-shaped. Probably something that uh, Matt Hancock could have read yesterday, the way things have gone with him. It's all gone a little pear-shaped, hasn't it? And now the Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, being a money man, is now running the medical side of things, which probably means that the Education Minister will be doing the accounting tomorrow at this rate, and the whole world will go somewhere stranger than that. You know, when you look at lamentations, when you look at the pain, those words that we've got today in our first reading are encouragement to us. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercies continue. And lamentations lays very strongly at God's feet the blame for all that's going on, and we do that. And we have our troubles, we have the things that beset us with tears and trials and so often we try in our own strength to get through. Those words today are the first encouragement I want you to take away. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning, every day God's love is renewed, God's grace is within us. And you think well that's really good because the next reading is one that quite often, especially the church has this big idea that if you've got money, we're great, we're doing well. If you've got lots of people, we are great. Actually, we are rich because of Christ's poverty. And this reading is often used by people, the two Corinthians, to say, give everything you've got, bring all your money into the storehouse. We need everything you've got and more. We're so poor. My dad always used to say to me, well, the Church of England is the most wealthy organisation outside of the, the royal household. They own everything, and they do in London. They own so much of the property, so much around the world, so much of farming in our nation has land owned by the Church of England. And um, This passage isn't about getting you to give today. It's about getting you to give your life, not your money. But it says no one should go without. This is a passage in which Keir Hardy and others said that made Jesus the, the first proper communist. The man who has little has enough. The man who has a lot has enough to give away. It's about sharing what we've got. No one should be without. The Church of England, the Church of Rome, Elim, the Catholics, the Pentecostals, the Baptists, the 
evangelical churches, the AOG, you name it, you find a denomination, URC, it's all the same. If there are people hungry in our land, then we are wrong. If there are people who are needy or oppressed or homeless or naked, and the church doesn't act, we are wrong. Out of the richness of the grace that God has given us, we are called in our prosperity to remember the words of lamentation in their loss, in their grief, in their bereavement, that God's love never fails, his mercies never come to an end. And God's love shown to us by Christ made flesh means that we, like Christ, should be willing to give everything. Yesterday I was privileged enough to do a prayer at the opening of the Armed Forces Day at the Arboretum. And I said to the people there, this, if you're a person of faith, is a prayer. And if you're a person of no faith, this is a reflection for you to ponder. And I talked of a sacrificial love, the sacrificial love of the armed forces, selfless commitment. No one has greater love than to lay down their life for their friend. And I talked about sacrifice and love which gives so much that calls us to share that love, to give grace, to act where there is need. And that's what these two readings bring you together, to give you a hint of in despair, grace, the steadfast love never fails, never comes to an end. In your richness, and we are such a rich country. When I worked in Kenya, People saw us as so very rich. I took people who had ordinary jobs. We were ordinary people, all of us. Typists and office workers who said, I've got no money, I can't even really afford to pay my rent some months. But when you saw the people in the ghettos, in the shambles, in the slum districts, you realised how rich we were. These two come together to make us reflect on a rich synagogue leader, Jairus. And there he is with all of his robes and he's well thought of. He was the man who was respected and admired. He was the man who had it all. He didn't have to worry about the steadfast love in despair because he was at the top of his game. A bit like the players before they kicked off yesterday in the first and second games. They were riding high, but his daughter was dying, his 12-year-old daughter. And being the Church of England, if someone important had come in, or the Church of Rome, I do understand that suddenly the last two marriages that our Prime Minister had are no longer marriages, but the one he's had now is, because he's become a Catholic again. And you think, what would the church do if someone rich came in and said, hello, my daughter's ill? I'd say, well, I'll leave this lot, mate. I'll come with you. There might be a legacy in it for the church, or you might want to give us a few bob. We'll give you a place at the front of the church. And we see this so often when we do mare making and all the chain gang are there with, you know, I'm so important. Oh, good, the plebs are behind me. Good, good, good. Jesus didn't do that. There's Jesus walking along, going to the rich man, to the leader's house. And as he walks, they're all crowding in, going, what's your Jesus? Do us a favour, give us a bit of a healing, will you? you know, give us, share God's love, do a miracle, show us who you are. And this woman just touches him. And he feels the power go out of him. And he stops. Now, this woman shouldn't even be anywhere near him. A woman with an issue of blood. You don't go anywhere, dear. You keep out the way. You are ritually unclean. High and mighty, lower than the low. And Jesus stops and says, who did that? And they all go, what are you talking about? Ever been to a football match or a crowd when something's happening, they're all jostling and you don't know who's touching your necks and hitting your elbow. And Jesus said, who did it? Now this passage for me has a very important thing. I've met a man, I met a very important man. And he 
He told me he was so important that he didn't have time for people like me. He was a senior cleric. He was someone who was up there and he went even further just after or a bit later and got a purple shirt. And he was so important and I was nothing. He made that clear. Well, that's what Jesus makes clear in stopping for that woman. That although she shouldn't have been there, something happened. And um, this man said to me, I was, as I was going through my journey towards ordination, he said, what's your favourite passage in the Bible? I suppose you have one, do you? And I said, I do. What is it? I said, well, it's really funny. It's Mark 5. It's a great passage. Why? I said, I'd like to think that one day I might be a priest in the Church of England who has people who are audacious enough to touch the hem of Jesus' garment and be healed. He said, and what will you do when you're like all the other vicars with churches that are declining? I said, I guess I'll be like you. He didn't write a very, very impressive letter to the bishop about me. He didn't say, this man needs to be ordained immediately. In fact, he actually tried to pull the carpet out from under me because I had no respect for senior clergy in the Church of England. I'm glad I'm in St Francis Church because St Francis Church gave up everything to be rich in Christ and poor in the world's eyes. Jesus stops and spends all his time finding out about this woman. He listens to her story and he says, your faith has set you free. That just touching me, that belief that I am the person whose steadfast love never comes to an end, whose mercies never fail. You were healed. And they come up and say, excuse me, boss, I wouldn't bother to take him back now. Your daughter's dead. And Jesus turns around and goes, don't listen to them. Just believe. And he takes the man back and they're weeping and wailing. They know lamentation firsthand. God, why have you let my loved one die? If I had a pound for every time I've heard that, my goodness me. Well, I don't know. I'd probably have more than £2.50. And you know, that's the big problem. People do this, people say this. God, why have you done this? That's what lamentation is about. And Jesus says to them in his actions, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. From the richness of God's grace in God made flesh, that healing comes. We look at the world, we look at its money, we look at its power, we look at its cleverness. And out of the foolishness of faith comes those wonderful words, Talitha Kum, little girl, come, get up. There's no problem too big, no situation too bad, nothing irredeemable. I was really rather broken to think a 42 and 43 year old person, each with three kids apparently, could be upset that they got caught in a bit of a romantic tryst outside of their marriage. And people are saying, hang them, throw them out. I don't know where their relationships are going, but that's what we need to pray for, for the healing of their marriages. That's what we need to pray for today, that people in power realise that nothing they've been, nothing they've seen, nothing they've done, no power that they've got, overwhelms, negates, or denies God's love in their lives, and that they might know those words and might turn, might repent, might be healed, restored, renewed, and their relationships mended. We all fall, we all stumble, our faith smells like that stuff they spread on the fields. And that's what the readings want you to know today, that in depth of despair, God's steadfast love, his mercies, his grace never comes to an end. In our richness, in our wealth, in our having, we share with others 
I worked in an industry where when people retired in their early 40s, you didn't go much past 45, they'd retire with a, a gratuity, a little gift from the bank, two or three million pounds, depending how well they'd done over the years, and they'd have seven or eight in the bank as well. They live for money, and as one woman said, you may have your faith, but I have money. And I said, you may have money, but I am happy. I am. Unhappy are you. She said, yes, but I'm unhappy in so much style. God wants you to know today that if you've got, you share. If you haven't got, then you receive. And that no matter how big, how powerful, how important the person in front of you is, my father always used to say, the Queen looks just like us when she's sitting on the loo. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you are. It matters who Christ is in your life. So lament, joy, need. Our God is able, our God is great, our God is good. And his steadfast love never comes to an end. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that we live in a broken, confused and wrong world. And there are times of tears, there are times of plenty and of famine, there are times when we maybe get our perspectives wrong and think the wrong people are important. But as much as we do whatever we do for the least in this world, we do it for you. As much as we forgive, as much as we enable, as much as we love, we reflect the love of the God. We reflect the life of the God made flesh. And we make real the power of the Spirit within us. May that always be our truth, Lord. Amen. And so let us, oh look, we didn't change the screen. That's better. Let us declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who lives on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. So let us pray. Father God, we pray this day for all in authority around the world, that they would understand what they have is given. What they have, they have not by right, but by grace. And Lord, those who form the 93% of this nation who do not go to good schools, who go to state schools. As the radio broadcast yesterday spoke of so many people who've made it, who felt second class because of their poor upbringing, their poor schools they went to, the places, their accents, which they very, very much lost, and everything else. Father, it's not what we look like to the world. May they understand it's what we look like to you and how we keep your laws and serve the, your people and how we serve those who are put under our care. Father God, this day, heal our politicians and leaders. Strengthen their arms that they might do good. Teach them what integrity is in life and in office. And Father, may we realise that if one in our community, one in our nation, suffers through need, deprivation or oppression, then the whole world is broken and suffers also. Help us to use the riches we have the love that we share to change the world around us, we pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. And Father God, we pray also this day for the church that it would be a place 
not of the world's power, but of your power, that our foolishness would overcome the wisdom of the wise, of this world's wise, for this kingdom's foolishness is true wisdom. Help us to build your church. Help us not to play power games. Help us not to divide that we may rule, but to unite that Christ may rule in all that we are and all that we proclaim as church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father God, we pray also this day for the people on our hearts and minds. For those we know, and we know so many at this time, for those we know who are still fearful, and rightly so, of COVID and its implications, for our loved ones with cancers, for our friends and families with needs, for the people in our churches, and we pray especially for Viv this day as she takes to her bed, that she would know your hand on her life. And in the stillness of wherever we find ourselves, we lift to you the names on our hearts and minds now. Father God, may they be surrounded by your steadfast love this day and every day of their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for those who we love and see no longer, those who are often in our thoughts and minds, those who bring remembrance of good times, and joy and sadness tinge and mingle. And we wait for the Christ to return and the dead to be raised and for us to be one. Father God, comfort all who mourn this day be with them and may your church minister your love to them. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Peace to you from God, our Father. Peace to you from his Son, Jesus Christ, who is his, our peace. Peace from the Holy Spirit, the life giver. The peace of the triune God be always with you and also with you. So peace wherever you are, guys. Have a good day. Remember, we're back. We're here. If we can do anything to help, that's what we're here for. We are church. We are one. And if one in church has a need, then church is failing. And as we come to break bread, and I'm sorry I know I've gone on in my sermon today, so much for trying to keep it short, it's because I've been away for two weeks, you just can't, can't get the clergy. Can't get too much of that though. As we bring the bread and wine, we say together, the Lord is here, his spirit is with us. So lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise. Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. For he is your living word. Through him you have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. Through him you have freed us from the slavery of sin, giving him to be born of a woman and to die upon the cross. You raised him from the dead and exalted him to your right hand on high. Through him you have sent upon us your holy and life-giving spirit and made us a people for your own possession. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thank. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thank. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which he shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom, and with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ your Son, our Lord. For great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours for ever and ever. Amen. And as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. So draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Most merciful, your love compels us to come in. Our hands were unclean, our hearts were unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from under your table. But you, Lord, are the God of our salvation and share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son that he may live in us and we in him, and that we with the whole company of Christ may sit and eat in your kingdom. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, comforter, the afflicted and healer of the broken, you have fed us at the table of life and hope. Teach us the ways of gentleness and peace, that the world may acknowledge the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so we say, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you, our souls and bodies, to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, now the Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love now and always. Amen. Let's go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the, in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for turning out here and for wherever you are and whenever you see this, may God be with you. May his mercies never come to an end. Have a good day, have a good week and remember we're here if we can help. Take care. And I press the button every time till the last one. I don't know. Can't get the clergy. Bye, guys. <laughs>